He's taken the lead at world record for Maklangu. Ndando Mahlangu with his double gold at the Tokyo Paralympics. 16-year-old Paralympian Busele Mabote, blade sprinter Debu Homofugeng. A small sample of amputees around the country whose lives have been turned around due to the partnership of two men, Johann Sneders and Michael Stevens, both with their own histories. My brother found me. He said that I was lying on the grass and that I had set the grass around me alight. It was starting to smolder and things. Uh, he came to do CPR because he didn't know what was going on. He opened my mouth. I had swallowed my tongue. He pulled my tongue out. I started to scream. He knew I was alive. When Michael Stevens was 12, he lost both his legs in a freak accident that almost claimed his life. It was 1992. Michael, his 22-year-old brother Richard and 25-year-old sister Carolyn decided to spend the day at the Val Dam. It was a perfect day. My middle brother, Richard, and Michael just got in a car and we went down to the Val for the day. It was a very normal thing that we had done often. So the weather wasn't great for sailing and there was a land yacht, which is essentially a windsurfer type setup with wheels. You can go on sand roads and kind of a little bit off-road and let the wind drive you. So we set that up and I jumped on it first. ESCOM had recently installed new power lines for the cottages at the club. They were laid low with no safety or warning signs. As Michael sped across the sand, his mast touched a high-tension electricity wire. Michael was hit with 33,000 volts of electricity. Richard and I at the same time said, where's Michael? And it was as if the world went dead quiet and we could just see smoke. He was on fire, his clothes were burning. I picked Michael up and his back was just jelly. It was terrible. <laughs> I could see all the way through his ankle to his bone, his shoes had melted. Michael landed up at Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital, which in 1992 had one of the best burn units in the country. The medical team waited for three days to see whether Michael would live, then recommended that both his legs be amputated because the risk of infection was too high. 70% of his body was suffering from third degree burns. It was that or he'd die. The legs were dead. What they said to my mom is, once you survive the initial electrocution, the biggest risk to my life from there was infection because I essentially had no skin left on my body. I have, I have my face, my chest and my stomach. That's it. He was obviously very drugged and he just looked at me and he said, no, I'm going to live, mum, don't worry. And then he was in and out of consciousness. After seven months at Chris Hani Baragwanath, Michael spent the next year undergoing skin grafts and more procedures. The first time they allowed him to come home, he weighed 19 k's. I mean, he was a thin waif with just bandages everywhere. Despite the advice that he should go to a school for the disabled, Michael was adamant to return to King Edward Preparatory School. In a wheelchair, bandaged, head to toe, no toes. I had people pushing my chair and jumping me over things and not really thinking about it, just having fun with me, which was scary and great. While his ambition to play cricket for the country was not achievable, he was soon part of the rowing team, despite no legs. He used to leave his legs on the side, get in and, you know, once Mike was mobile, Mike was mobile. Let's fast forward now and let's talk about meeting your Hans Sneders. How did that happen? I was trying to make the South African team for the Paralympics for rowing. And one day at one of the training sessions, Johan arrived. He was telling me about this non-profit that he started for disabled kids. It was really interesting. I could tell that we were on the same kind of wavelength. Okay, on the bed. Johan had interned and worked at Osur in Iceland, a company world-renowned for its work in orthopedics. He became part of the team revolutionizing the making and fitting of prosthetics for developing countries. In general, prosthetics are, are a lengthy process. 
in a government type hospitals, it's, it's something from a four to six weeks delivery period to make an actual prosthesis. So if you're from a rural area and you have to travel in and out to go for prosthetic fitting, it's costly. And if it doesn't fit, you have to travel all the way back. So we would see the amputees, you would manufacture a prosthesis, you would assemble it on the same session, and then um, you could uh, start rehabilitation immediately. With Osseo, Johan traveled to Angola, Mozambique, to deserts and hard to get to villages, fitting amputees with their innovative prosthetics that could be manufactured and fitted in one session. We made some difference following the earthquake in Pakistan and the disasters in Haiti and yeah, I had also had a stunt in Gaza. So it's nice to be able to work in these countries and then transfer technology and get the local guys involved and, and then teach them how to do this and then they can indep be independent when you leave. Michael Stevens and Johan Sneders, a perfect partnership. Johan wanted to make a difference and Michael was questioning his role in life. How does a kid from a disadvantaged background, born into disability and poverty, escape? And Jumping Kids was the result. Ndando Mashangu was one of their first beneficiaries. In 2012, he was fitted with a set of prosthetic blades by Johan. I went to see Johan in this room. Um, he was sitting there, I was sitting there. And then he asked me, he said, young man, how can I help you? And I said to him, I just want to run. And I think me and him, the connection between me and Johan, it, it started then. We fitted him with a pair of uh, blades and um, he, he took like a duck to water. Johan was keeping contact with the school and he was asking them how is Ntando doing and then they told him, no, Ntando is walking without his crutches. And I was like, what? How? Within a period of five days. So yeah, it, it's, yeah it's, it's been a beautiful journey. It could have been a very different journey. Michael's first legs were from a state hospital. I look at this and I wonder how you move. What a contraption. Correct. And in theory, it's about safety, but what they've actually done is made it unusable. I wore it for about a year. And then this is where I gave up and I went back into the wheelchair. Kids like in Tando, they get elephant legs. It's just a one piece, like you would see an elephant leg down to the bottom with a round circle rubber pad on the bottom. Done. Cheers. Go. And they're heavy. Jumping Kids got Ndando into a mainstream school, which, unlike the disabled school, offers matric and sport. He is their first case study, a blueprint of a holistic rehabilitation of an amputee. The moment we got him into schools and started to get things going, we knew that that was the trajectory, that he could make Rio. Ndando's silver at Rio Paralympics was just a prelude of what was to come. I'm at a place now where it's my job to inspire and to create opportunities for others, giving the children of South Africa an opportunity to be mobile and to move around. Ndando is already paying it forward. Busele Tsomabote came into the Jumping Kids stable when he was seven years old. He had an emergency amputation after a car crash when he was five. When I saw the Paralympics for the first time, I was inspired by Ndando Mashango. I saw his 200 meter race, I was like, yeah, I wanna be like that. And then after that, fast forward a year, um, I went to my first international competition. That's where Johan saw that, yeah, I have potential. Five years later in 2019, Buseletso started at King Edward High School. That same year, he set a new world record in the men's 200 meter at the World Para-Athletics Junior Championships. And then there was the 2020 Tokyo Paralympics. I've already achieved my first goal for the Paralympics, just to make it to the Paralympics and make the finals. Now I want that world record and then just win gold in the next Paralympics. So I'm really aiming for Paris 2024. At Jumping Kids, the youngest child is a year old and the oldest 18. And while not everyone is an athlete, they have the access to write their own story. When I stepped into it, I stepped into it naively with an idea that oh, you can just do you know, some good and you've got a year that you need to figure out, let's go do this. But it was more than that. It, it, it was a calling. It's, it's evolved and it became something that I can't walk away from anymore. You're changing people's lives. I'm also changing my own. <laughs>